This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Hi everybody, welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. Today's show is all about the Virginia oyster. We're here on the shores of the York River and we're visiting the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's Oyster Restoration Center. We're going to find out what they're doing to help bring up the population of oysters, keeping our water clean and keeping the oysters tasty. That's straight ahead on this edition of Virginia Farming. Here we are on the York River and I'm joined by Jackie Shannon and Jackie is the manager of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's Oyster Restoration Center. Jackie, thank you so much for having us out here today. My pleasure. Thank you for coming. So let's start with oysters. Most of us eat oysters. Most of us love oysters and especially the ones that are here from Virginia. But what makes oysters so good for the Chesapeake Bay? Well, each oyster is like a living water treatment plant. As they're filtering for algae, their natural food source, they're also cleaning up the water. So their cumulative impact of having a thriving oyster population is very, very significant. And it's really important habitat for so many of the other species in the bay that we find important too. So what's been going on in the bay to make the oyster restoration process necessary? Well, we've been working with partners um, all over the Bay in Maryland and Virginia to rebuild oyster habitat, which has been limited since oysters were over harvested for many, many decades. Uh, for a long time, oyster shells weren't returned to the Bay, and that's one of the most important resources for restoring oysters. So what we're doing is rebuilding oyster habitat using shells, using alternative structures like concrete, and then going back um, after the fact and putting live oysters on those reefs to help jumpstart those populations. So how long in general has the whole oyster restoration process been going on? In Virginia, there have been replenishment efforts by the Virginia Marine Resources Commission to keep the public, public fishery um, afloat. But restoration for the sake of ecological benefits really didn't start in Virginia until the 1990s. CBF first got involved with oyster restoration in 1998 with a citizen-based program called Oyster Gardening, which gives uh, folks that have access to tidal waters in Virginia an opportunity to grow oysters alongside their dock and then return them to the Bay Foundation to be planted on sanctuary reefs. So it's a great way for the public to get involved and a great way to get hundreds of thousands more oysters out on these reefs. Since then, CBF has expanded their program significantly um, in Virginia to incorporate adding spat on shell, reef ball production, shell recycling, and we've been using the main campus of the Virginia Institute of Marine Science since 2006 to work with volunteers to meet those goals and conduct those programs. Okay, now you just said spat on shell. Mm -hmm. So explain to us what that is. A spat refers to a baby oyster. You usually call an oyster a spat when it's less than a year old. And we induce baby oysters or spat to permanently attach to oyster shells. So we go out and plant the oyster shells. They already have that instant population of oysters that'll start to thrive. I want to talk a little bit about where we are today here on the York River. Now, the Restoration Center is actually on the land of the William and Mary Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so tell us how that came to be and, and how you chose this area. Virginia Institute of Marine Science is a wonderful partner and they are a part of the William and Mary campus. This is a very specific uh, graduate program for uh, uh, people that are pursuing marine science. They have been a very generous partner since we started working with them in um, the early 2000s, letting us um, use part of their work site to uh, host all of our restoration programs. And we really chose this area based on it being a nice hub, a central location for being able to work north and south in Virginia. And also, it's uh, access to very, very clean water. Being here on the York River, uh, behind me we have a national forest, which is a wonderful buffer. It really ensures that we're using some of the best possible water to um, jumpstart these oysters and give them a, a really good shot at being able to go out and thrive. So I'd like for you to walk us through the process. Mm -hmm. What ha you, you have the oyster shells, where do the oyster shells come from, and then what happens next? 
Well, you could argue that the oyster industry is probably one of our best and uh, most important partners because that's one of the um, ways that we are able to acquire oyster shell. That's a wonderful resource for restoring oyster populations. And so most of the shells that we um, have coming to us for restoration come from oyster roasts and restaurants. And a lot of those restaurants are being supplied by local growers, uh, even here in the York River. And so once we acquire the oyster shells, we allow them to age or cure so that there isn't any organic matter on them anymore, um, get them as clean as possible. And then volunteers help us to load them into large 800 gallon tanks. We add seawater from the York River, and then we add oyster larvae, which we acquire from hatcheries. They induce adult oysters to spawn. They sieve off the fertilized um, embryos. And when they're in the state of development where they're ready to make that permanent attachment onto an oyster shell or some other substrate, they sell them to us. We place them into the tanks. And once those oyster larvae permanently attach to the shells and become spat, we're able to go out and volunteers again assist us in the process of planting them onto sanctuary reefs and rivers. And on an annual basis, we're able to produce and transplant about 10 million oysters, all on those recycled oyster shells. 10 million oysters. Wow. It sounds like a lot, but it's really a drop in the bucket compared to what needs to be done. We're really trying to uh, conduct oyster restoration on a scale that can be mimicked on, um, on a larger approach um, and really have a cumulative impact baywide. So with this restoration process in place, have you seen, have you seen a change in the water? We have in areas that restoration has been done on the appropriate scale for the right amount of time. And one of the best examples I think we have in the whole Chesapeake Bay is right here in Virginia, and that's the Lynn Haven River. Uh, several years ago, most of that river was completely closed to oyster harvesting, just down to a, a very small percent. Now, almost half of that river is open for direct harvesting of oysters. And it doesn't mean that it's a free for all. Again, there's very wise management. But what it does uh, speak to is that that water quality has improved significantly due to a lot of things being done on the land, improvements in the shellfish resource uh, being done in the river. So you say you have restaurants involved in recycling the oyster shells. Mm -hmm. What about individuals? What can individuals do to help with the cause? Well, we are a very volunteer-based program. In fact, volunteers are the oil that runs this machine. Without their assistance, we would never make our annual goals. So people can come out, assist us with any of our programs, which are year-round. And also, uh, people can um, recycle oyster shells at their oyster roasts in their communities, ask the restaurants if they're recycling oyster shells. Every single shell really does have a big impact and can turn into a handheld oyster reef. Um, and if people have access to tidal waters, we encourage them to become an oyster gardener. That's the program where folks can grow oysters off the side of their dock for one year. They start as very small baby oysters and families get to watch those oysters grow as they care for them. So it's a very involved program and the benefits are very localized. The oysters are gonna be filtering the water right there by uh, the citizen's dock. And then after one year, the oysters come back to us. They're mature and capable of reproducing and they go out and uh, reseed some of these sanctuary reefs and really help to uh, jumpstart our populations all over the bay. When you say you're building reefs, is that just going out and piling up a big strand of oyster shells? How does that work? It is really about that simple. <laughs> First, we find an area that can support the weight of shells or concrete. Uh, we don't want to put things in, in really um, sticky mud where it's just going to sink. So nice sandy bottom areas that can support weight are very ideal in the intertidal zone too, which are where oysters um, have adapted to thrive, where the tide goes up and down. Uh, they're completely fine to be exposed a few hours of the day, and it also puts them in areas that are way out of um, any kind of danger of being a navigational hazard. So those areas are very ideal for all kinds of reasons. Uh, once we scope out the areas and identify them, then we bring in um, uh, concrete and usually top it off with a shell veneer and then come back and put live oysters on top of it. So you pretty much have an instant oyster reef over the course of several weeks. Wow, okay. And then how long from the time that that reef is built will, can you harvest adult oysters again? Well, the, the reefs that we're working on are going to be off limits to harvesting indefinitely. But one thing that's important to note is that as these oysters grow and spawn, and they only take one year to reach maturity and begin spawning, they may seed other areas that can be harvested. Uh, but generally, an oyster here in Virginia takes about two to three years in the wild to reach a market size. Okay. Now, 
you guys also work with oyster farmers, is that right? We do. In fact, one of the main avenues for CBF getting involved with oyster restoration here in Virginia was really supporting oyster aquaculture and actually having a work site dedicated to promoting the feasibility of growing oysters sustainably. And so once that was able to really take off and demonstrate success, we were able to back out of our involvement in aquaculture and really start focusing on the spat on shell production and more things for pure oyster restoration. But having a thriving oyster industry in Virginia and having people be able to do it sustainably is one of the most important things that's occurred for us still having an oyster industry that is where it is today. Well, we're going to go talk to one of those oyster farmers next and find out exactly what he does on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Jackie, thank you so much for having us out today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the support. So we've called up with oyster farmer Tommy Leggett. Tommy, thank you so much for having us out here today. Thank you. Tell us how long you've been farming oysters. I've been doing it for about 20 years, and prior to that I was a commercial waterman where I harvested crabs, oysters, clams, so I was a, a waterman or fisherman, if you will. And I changed over to oyster farming, think it would be more sustainable and more suitable for what I want to do, working on the bay. Okay. What is your affiliation with uh, Chesapeake Bay's Oyster Restoration Center? Well, I started it back in 2000. After I worked the water commercially for about 20 years and was still oyster farming, I took a job with CBF and uh, just because I could, or I was offered the job. And uh, so I started the Oyster Restoration Center and did that for about uh, it'll be 18 years in March. And I semi-retired last year and turned it over to Jackie. And so right now I'm, I'm simply working, doing a little bit of policy work and I'm phasing my way out. Um, I just want to go back to being a waterman. Well, I'm sure you were offered the job because 20, 20 years, uh, of being on the water is a lot of experience. Yeah. So you had to know what you were talking about, and I'm sure you knew the water like the back of your hand. Yeah, I knew a little bit, and if what I didn't know, I made up. <laughs> so what I didn't talk to Jackie about was the life cycle of an oyster. Right. Now, you know, they're putting the spats on these shells that have been recycled, but walk us through the, the lifespan of an oyster, how, how they all come to be. All right, well, Jackie purchases larvae, oyster larvae, from a hatchery. Mm -hmm. And in the hatchery, they mimic what happens in the wild. So they'll take male and female oysters and induce them to spawn. And when a male spawns, it releases sperm in the water. When a female spawns, it releases eggs in the water. And fertilization occurs in the water. And after fertilization, you have a, a viable embryo. It's a swimming embryo. It goes through several developmental stages swims around eating microscopic algae for a couple of weeks and after about two weeks 18 days it goes through a transformation or a metamorphosis its instinct is to go to the bottom of the river or creek or bay and look for a suitable substrate to attach itself to so a suitable substrate could be a beer can a bottle a boot a branch a shell preferably oyster shells they'll land on all kinds of shells because they're attracted to calcium carbonate and living oyster uh, resources. So that's why we use shells. They'll also attach to concrete and Jackie's making concrete reef balls as an alternative substrate because of the scarcity and lack of shells for restoration. So after they attach to the shell they go through a metamorphosis and that's when they become a spat. Jackie showed you those. Mm -hmm. It looks like a little teeny baby oyster and from there it grows. Uh, it'll be sexually mature in about a year. It'll be small but uh, in the wild or in nature, they'll grow about an inch a year. And they don't grow, the shells that you're recycling for th that the spat attached to don't become an oyster shell because each right. oyster creates its own shell, correct? The oyster extracts calcium carbonate from the water. Uh, there's a special organ or part of the oyster that actually makes the shell. It extracts the calcium from the seawater and lays down shell material as it grows. So as it grows, it adds on more shell. So what is the harvest season for an oyster? When, when, do you, when do you harvest them? For the wild fishery, which is a public resource owned by the Commonwealth of Virginia, owned by all citizens, it's managed by state agencies, and they have a season, October through March. 
and those seasons are managed, the quotas are managed, where they can work is managed. It's, it's highly regulated to protect the resource because that resource was over harvested so badly starting back in the 1800s. And that's why the oyster population is in such bad shape because it was mismanaged. So do you harvest your oysters from here on the York River or do you go out, are most of yours harvested from the bay? The York River, the bay mm -hmm. is, if you look out my creek, um, five, 10 miles from here is the bay. So I'm at the mouth of the York River, but I do go out in the York River to do my harvesting. Okay. Um, now, do you have specific spots? Yes. Like this is Tommy's and yep. this might be Joe's over here, but this is your area. Do you have a marked like yes. crab pots? Kind of, sort of. We, we lease uh, subaqueous bottom or bottom land from the state. Um, this will really make your farmers out in the valley upset because the lease fee that we pay is ridiculous. It's a dollar and a half an acre a year. Oh my goodness, um, how do you afford that? Yeah, it's rough. <laughs> but, um, you know, what that's done is to help promote aquaculture mm -hmm. and promote the, the wise use of these bottomlands. And we don't use a lot. Most of us, I've only got uh, about 10 acres that I use. So I don't need a lot of bottomland. Um, some states have really gone overboard on the lease fees but you'll find that up and down the East Coast, the states that have the highest fees, the highest regulations, the highest uh, rent are producing the fewest oysters. Virginia is leader on the East Coast to the point where most states want to be Virginia. So I think a lot of the regulations that Virginia has, the leasing structure in particular, has really done well to promote what we it's do. It's inviting. It's inviting, right. So the water here on the York is brackish, part salt, part right. fresh. Mm -hmm. Do you think that makes a difference in the oysters? Do they like the mixture? Yeah, well oysters evolve to grow in a wide range of salinities. They grow from, or that they exist in places that the salinity is uh, five parts per thousand or 0.5 percent all the way up to 3.2 percent or 32 parts per thousand. And depending on where they grow, in which salty parts of the bay dictates their flavor. So in 3.2% salt or 32 parts per thousand, it's going to be very salty. You're going to taste a big slug of salt. It's like putting your tongue on a salt shaker. Mm -hmm. Eating an oyster from Rock Hall, Maryland, which is very fresh, probably that's getting up there to the upper, I mean, the lower limits of their range, five parts per thousand. It's not going to have much salt at all, and it'll, you'll taste more of a mineral content mm -hmm. to the oyster. You'll taste just the minerals in the water. Where I am, it's, uh, it's about 20 parts per thousand, 2% salt. So it's on the upper end of the salt range, but it's, it, they're, they're quite salty. Um, you can taste a fair amount of salt, but you also taste the oyster itself. It's kind of a sweet tasting oyster with a little bit of salt. So what is it that you think makes Virginia oysters so good? I've had oysters from Washington State um, and from other parts of the country, and none of them taste as good as the Virginia oyster. What do you attribute to that? Well, if you were raised in Washington State, you'd probably say something different. That's, that's part of it. All about what you're used to. But being totally uh, biased, uh, I think Chesapeake Bay has the best oyster, and in particular the York River oysters are the best. But um, what, what's unique about the bay is the wide range of tastes. You can get the same species of oyster that tastes a hundred different ways depending on who grows it and where they're growing it. Um, the other thing that's really great about Virginia is we have a phenomenal shellfish sanitation department that um, does really good in enforcing and developing our regulations. We've got a safe record for shellfish consumption um, and we've, we've got a good bay. We've just got a lot of a lot of food out there for the oysters to feed on. So it's it's a whole different whole lot of different combinations of things that make the Chesapeake Bay a really great place to eat oysters. Okay. Well, you offered to take us out in the boat so we can watch you harvest some of these oysters. Are you ready? Yep. Are you ready to eat a few? I'm ready to eat a few. Okay. Let's go. All right. In the winter time, when it's cold, it's okay to harvest at low tide because the oysters are exposed and they're cold and they're hibernating. When it's summertime and it's hot and the oysters are exposed, in hot weather, they're not filtering, so any bacteria that's in there is multiplying exponentially, so it's not healthy to harvest oysters when they're high and dry. Now, these oysters have already been sorted, so they're, they're market ready. And all I have to do is come out and get them. So I'll go through and I'll pick out the very best of these, put the ones that aren't 
so good, put them back and let them cook a little bit longer. Put it in your mouth, one bite and swallow. One bite and swallow, here we go. Should be pretty salty. salty. Kind of a sweet, but buttery sweet. flavor. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Tommy, thank you so much for having us out. Thank you for bringing us out in the boat and letting us watch you harvest your oysters. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Eat more oysters. Absolutely. <laughs>to Williamsburg and we are at the Waypoint Seafood and Grill and I'm joined by executive chef Kyle Woodruff. Mm -hmm. Kyle, thank you so much for having us. Oh, you're very welcome. You've got two plates of these gorgeous oysters. Yes, ma'am. And these are oysters that came from Tommy Leggett that we were just with on his boat a little bit ago. Yep, fresh out of the water. It's, uh, it, it's Tommy and I have had a wonderful relationship over the last five, seven years and uh, having the opportunity to see from a chef's standpoint to go to the farm where you were and see the oysters being raised and in his processes and then him bringing them to the back door and every Thursday night coming out and, and hanging out on the on the bar with some of our uh, patrons to talk about oysters, oyster shell restoration, um, as well as aquaculture in general. So, Do you think it's kind of unique to have these oysters hand delivered by your oyster farmer? Absolutely and I, honestly I wouldn't have it any other way now that I've done business with Tommy for so long um, because the one thing that I know um, that you know, coming up in this business and, and every, from a culinary standpoint, everybody talks about sustainability, supporting your local resources. Um, and, and supporting those local resources are built off of relationships. So, uh, you know, being able to have that relationship with Tommy and, and his wife, Kim, to, to where we cook out together, we do business together, it, it's a wonderful relationship, so. How do you feel about Virginia oysters as a chef? What, do you think they, they differ from other oysters? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, one thing about Virginia that's uh, it's pretty phenomenal is that the uh, Virginia Marine Seafood Products Board, as well as a group of chefs, and I mean, there's just been so much effort to uh, work uh, work in the bay as part of oyster shell uh, oyster restoration, as well as uh, they've actually dissected the entire state to where you actually have seven different tasting regions. Uh, so you can go all up and down the Chesapeake Bay. You can go into Rappahannock River, York River, Eastern Shore. Is that the oyster trail that, is that part, I've read about? That okay. is the Virginia oyster trail. So okay. I think it's it's very unique. As in, uh, you know, we're we're one of the only states uh, that I don't want to say only. I shouldn't say only, but. Uh, one of the biggest oyster producing uh, states and, and the, the local economy gets behind it, they support it um, and, and to get to know people you know, uh, like Tommy uh, Leggett or, or the folks that are over at you know, Rappahannock River Oyster Company for instance or, or any of those guys that are out to support local sustainable resources, it's a fantastic plan. So, so you mentioned the restoration project mm -hmm. and that's really what we've been talking about all day today. Mm -hmm. What made you guys at Waypoint decide to get on board with the restoration project? Well, it was a pretty easy decision. I mean, it's a it's a simple process from us. I mean, you know, basically we we shuck and serve oysters, and then when they come out to the guests, they would go into the trash. Um, whereas uh, when Tommy and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation approached us about this uh, uh, restoration program, it's really simple. I mean, uh, the oysters go out to the guests. They get uh, our service. Uh, service staff will bring it back and uh, instead of dumping them in the trash they go to a, a separate container uh, it's a sealable container which is uh, stored and uh, we have folks from uh, CBF uh, come by you know two three times a week to pick them up and you know then they take them to their facility and go through the processes there so I mean it's very simple so it's really it's no work for the restaurant to become involved in this no not with the and when you have a good team like uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, supporting this and, and your efforts um, they go out of their way to make sure that things are, are done right so you don't ever have any issues with uh, build up of old oyster shells your health department doesn't really bother you a whole heck of a lot because you've got the support and then they're they're taken away so often so right is this something that you would recommend other restaurants who serve oysters absolutely I mean anybody in this area that first off doesn't serve a Virginia oyster ought to be ashamed of themselves <laughs> uh, being a chef in Virginia uh, but uh, as far as the uh, the oyster restoration project I mean it's very simple I mean there's nothing it goes in one bucket instead of another it's easy for the facility to to maintain and then you're also promoting a healthy bay you're working on uh, sustainable resources and it's a fantastic opportunity for everybody so absolutely. it's a win-win it is a win-win if, if another restaurant 
uh, wants to participate in this restor restoration program, what mm -hmm. do you suggest they do? Uh, it, it's real easy. Um, if, if they do business with a local uh, oysterman, they should have uh, ties to CBF anyways. Mm -hmm. um, to get involved is really easy. I mean, I would just talk to your oyster provider and, and say that, hey, I've heard about this program and, you know, it seems simple enough. I want to support you guys. I want to support the Bay and oyster growth and, and how, where's the dotted line? How do I sign on? Okay. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for having us out today. Absolutely, we, we it's appreciate our pleasure. It. These look delicious. Oh, My yeah. dad is going to be very jealous when he sees all these oysters <laughs> I could eat today. That does it for our show. Thanks so much for watching and have a great week. Mm -hmm. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org.